गुड आफ्टरनून वेलकम टू द लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग ऑफ इंडो क्रिप्ट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी प्री रिकॉर्डेड सेशन ट्रायर अपोलॉजीज फॉर मिस प्रोनाउंसिएशन इफ एनी द टॉक स्ट्रीम अंडर द सेगमेंट एप्लीकेशन आर द फर्स्ट टॉक इज एनक्रिप्टेड की वैल्यू स्टोर बाय अर्चिता अग्रवाल एंड सेनी कामरा द सेकेंड टॉक इज प्रूफ ऑफ रेपुटेशन ब्लॉक चेन विद नाकम आउट ऑफ ऑल बैक बैल यू आर नॉट क्लीन रॉक रेफल असरोस्की एंड मसलिस रिकास द थर्ड टॉक इज ट्रांसफरिंग यूजिंग फिलिप एंड टी एफ एल जी फॉर एन एफिशियंट डेलीकेशन ऑफ कॉम्पिटिशन बाय क्लेमेंट हॉफमैन पेरिक म्यूक्स एंड थॉमस रिकसेफ द फोर्थ टॉक इज डिलेट अथेंटिकेशन प्रिवेंटिंग रीप्ले एंड डीले अटैक्स इन प्राइवेट कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग बाय क्रेस्ट ऑफ पिच रैक हेलो एवरी वन मै नेम इज अर्चिता अगरवाल आई एम अ पी एच डी स्टूडेंट एट ब्राउन एंड टूडे आई विल टॉक अबाउट माई वर्क ऑन एनक्रिप्टेड की वैल्यू स्टोर्स This is joint work with uh, Seni Kamara. So I'll start with a brief introduction. Then I'll talk about uh, the technical work on key value stores, and finally I'll end my talk with some future directions. So these days the entire world is running on distributed systems, right? All the big companies have their infrastructures built on top of distributed systems. So almost all the apps that we use today. they use uh, these distributed systems so for example amazon's cart or facebook's messenger or google drive and there are so many other apps uh, which use uh, distributed systems to store data and as you can see from these examples all these systems they store very very sensitive data about us for example they store our sensitive photographs our health records email data geographical location browsing history and so on and so forth but these days what we are seeing is that these uh, systems are getting breached uh, on regular basis for example there was a breach at facebook that leaked our photographs then there was a breach at capital one which leaked our credit card and social security numbers then there was also a breach at quest diagnostics for example which leaked our health records so so this is this is very serious right um so the question is that if i'm storing sensitive data in these systems and i want to prevent these breaches what can i do so well one solution is to use cryptography which is one of the best tools we have to prevent certain kinds of data breaches and we can integrate cryptography into these existing systems in some way so i'm just talking about like certain kinds of data breaches not all but cryptography can definitely prevent some of these data breaches so in this talk i'll talk about how we can formalize the use of encryption in distributed key value stores and it turns out that most of the systems that i talked about earlier the storage systems like amazon's cart or google drive or dropbox they use distributed key value stores as their building block so uh, because these key value stores are such a basic building blocks so if we can somehow get encryption in them we can then build all sorts of privacy preserving storage systems on top of them So this brings uh, me to the next part of my talk on how we can design and analyze encrypted key value stores and here is a detailed outline of my talk. So let me start by explaining what are key value stores in in detail. So key value stores are essentially these distributed and decentralized systems that are used to store and retrieve data to and from the servers that can be spread all across the world. So these are servers and we'll be storing data in these servers uh to support then uh, data storage and retrieval uh, key value stores support two operations get and put put is used to, to store data while get is used to retrieve data and in particular put takes as input a key uh, key value pair and uh, it stores this pair on one of these nodes then get takes as input a key and retrieves the value that is associated with this key back and for fault tolerance what key value stores do is that um, they replicate our key value pairs on multiple nodes instead of just storing this key value pair on a single node so for example let's say uh, in this case uh, if i want to store this pair instead of just let's say storing it on one node i will replicate it on multiple nodes here my replication factor is 3 and since 
data is replicated across multiple nodes, these Kegi value stores employ some sort of synchronization mechanism to keep the replicas uh, consistent with each other. And in distributed systems literature, there is a whole spectrum of consistency notions. Some are weak, some are strong, um, in the sense that strong ones can make a write instantaneously visible on all the replicas, whereas the weak consistency notions might take some time in uh, getting your con uh, replicas in a consistent state. So um, a read, if you do a read operation before, let's say, consistency is reached, this read operation can return different values. And the set of possible values that it can output depends on the kind of consistency guarantee that your key value store is providing you. And we'll see later uh, in the talk that this notion of consistency, which is clearly important for distributed systems, also has an impact on security. Okay, so um, apart from these get and put operations, these key value stores, they also support a routing protocol, which essentially is a communication protocol that nodes use to talk to each other. Right? Because nodes are not just in one place, they're spread all over the world, so they need to talk to each other for which they use the specific uh, routing protocol that comes with key value store. And now for the rest of my talk, uh, instead of calling uh, these things as keys and values, I will call them uh, as labels, labels and values. And the reason is that uh, in cryptography, key is reserved for cryptographic keys, so I do not want to create any confusion. So I'll be calling them as labels, so label value pairs. Okay, so now let us see an example of a consistent hashing based key value store. There are a lot of key value stores that are based on consistent hashing. For example, Dynamo used by Amazon, uh, Cassandra used by Facebook, or Voldemort uh, used by LinkedIn. They all are based on consistent hashing. So uh, these uh, CHKVS, as I would call them, uh, they have a logical address space A that they organize in a circuit. So just imagine these addresses as some beta strings of certain length. So um, for example, here I have showed A to be a set of all bit strings of length five. So then starting from zero, arrange them in a circle. So then zero, one, two, tuck, 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 all the way till 32. So at setup time, uh, the CHKVS outputs three hash functions, H1, H2, and H3. H1 hashes node IDs to addresses. So you can imagine that you have your nodes, which can be anywhere in the world but then uh, they are given a spot on this logical circle. So all these are nodes that are given a spot on the circle. Then the second hash function, H2, hashes labels to addresses. And so does this third hash function, H3. It also hashes labels to node addresses. And I will later describe how uh, get and put operations, they use H2 and H3. Okay. So all the nodes at a uh, setup time, they also set up their routing tables, which enables them to talk to each other. So there are two kinds of routing protocols that are more, most prevalent. The first one is a multi-hop routing protocol in which messages from one node will hop through small number of nodes before reaching their destination node. Whereas in uh, zero hopping, uh, zero hop routing protocol, all the nodes can talk to each other directly. So there are no intermediate hops. And um, I'm not going to describe how specifically these routing protocols work because they, dif they differ from a one key, key value store to other key value store. And it's also not important for our purposes. So I'll just skip it, skip it but uh, just know that there exists a routing protocol for each uh, key value store. Okay. So now uh, let's see how put operations are implemented in uh, CHKVSS. So let's say that a client needs to execute a put operation. So put, let's say L4V4. So the first thing it needs to compute is the front end node, which essentially will act as the client's entry point in the network. So here, uh, what client does is that it computes the front end node as h3 of l4 so it uses this third hash function so um, and then 
after uh, it computes the front end node it forwards forwards the request to that front end node then what the front end node does is that it computes the replicas for this label value pair right because we need to store this somewhere in the network right so the front end nodes the front end node actually computes those replicas to and to compute those replicas it computes h2 of l4 so let's say it's this red point over here but as you can see that there is no node over here so essentially you cannot store this pair on this address right because there is no node over there so what uh, what the front end node then does is that it computes the successor of this address and the successor is essentially the first node that you would encounter if you travel on this circle in clockwise direction so for example this is the first successor of this address over here so this becomes the first replica of l4 and the value associated with it which is v4 then it also computes the second successor which then becomes the uh, second replica of this uh, label value pair and once all the replicas are computed um, the the front end node then forwards the request to all these replicas and then these replicas finally store the label value pairs uh, with themselves okay um yeah so this is this is the second replica and this is the front end node sorry my animations are a little bit out of order um so because we want to analyze the security properties of encrypted key value stores we realized that the first thing we needed to do was abstract out its core components so that we can then use these abstractions in our mathematical analysis and this is how we did it um, we realized that a key value store implicitly defines four mappings the first is an address mapping uh, that maps nodes uh, to logical addresses and as we saw in our example for chkvs this address mapping is essentially h1 right the second mapping uh, is a front end mapping that maps labels to addresses again for chkvs this would be h3 right this is what the client was using to compute that front end node then the third mapping is a replicas mapping uh, which maps labels to a set of addresses and intuitively these set of addresses essentially represent the addresses of the replicas so for um, chkvs this would be the successor mapping composed with h2 right because that's what we did we first computed h2 of the label and then uh, then uh, computed the successors of those hashes and finally there is a route mapping which takes in two addresses and returns the set of nodes that would fall on the path uh, of these two nodes okay so um, now that we have defined our key value stores and abstracted uh, their components the next step we do is start thinking about uh, encrypted key value stores and how we can formalize them and study their security so we use the provable security paradigm to do so and uh, as part of uh, the provable security paradigm the first step uh, we did was to define uh, its syntax as in what do we mean by an encrypted key value store so encrypted key value store it consists of four protocols uh, gen setup put and get uh, these three protocols they are similar to that uh, for plain key value stores so the only difference is that now put and get would also take encryption keys which would be used to encrypt our label value pairs and uh, gen is another uh, protocol that clients would use to generate these uh, encryption keys okay okay so after we fixed our syntax the next step was to define the security uh, security definition so before that let me just quickly uh, describe our adversarial model we consider a static and passive adversary so this adversary hacks in some of these machines and after he hacks it's going to sit there forever and see whatever happens at these machines so it's passive so it's not going to do anything else but it's just going to observe and try to gather as much information as it can okay 
So uh, the definition had the same flavor as MPC style definitions. So we think of two experiments, uh, the real experiment and the ideal experiment. So in the real ex experiment, we are actually running the protocol. So all the get and put operations are really being executed. Whereas in the ideal experiment, we want to create a simulator uh, which using the leakage can uh, simulate a fake view. Right, so that these two experiments, they start looking indistinguishable to an adversary. Right, and this leakage is essentially uh, the information that the adversary will learn. Okay, and we say that if we can create such a simulator which, which, is, uh, which can successfully uh, fool the adversary, then our uh, uh, EKVS protocol or encrypted key value store protocol is secure. So now that we have our syntax and we have our security definition, now we would prove that our EKVS construction meets this definition. So of course, the first thing I need to do is to describe this construction, which then we'll prove to be secure. Okay, let's see how the construction works. So the first protocol is the gen protocol. Uh, it samples two keys, K1 and K2. Uh, K1 is essentially the key that we'll use for the PRF and k2 is an encryption key and gen protocol then outputs both k1 and k2 so uh, the put protocol takes as input a key k and a label value pair uh, it then applies a prf f on this label l to get this sort of prf label t and it then encrypts the value v to get this encrypted value e it then gives this sort of encrypted label value pair t and e to a plain text key value store which then essentially stores this this sort of encrypted label value pair in the network right then get works in a similar way you have a key k and label l so again you apply the prf on the label l to compute your t then you give this t uh, then you give this value t uh, to the key value store which then fetches the encrypted value e associated with t and then you just decrypt uh, E to get your V back. So uh, let's look at its analysis now. So the question was that essentially now that your data is encrypted, now you're not storing plain text label value pairs, but instead you are storing uh, sort of encrypted label value pairs. So what kind of security can you expect out of this scheme? So in our work, we consider two different settings, a single user setting and a multi-user setting. So in the single user setting, clients uh, do not share their data with other clients, whereas in multi-user setting, they do. So uh, in, in multi-user setting, they can be two clients working on the same piece of data at the same time because they are sharing data with each other, right? Whereas in single user setting, this is not going to happen. So at, at a time, only one client will be operating on one piece of data. So we show that in, in the multi-user setting, the EKVS construction uh, that I showed earlier is L-secure with a uh, high probability. And uh, L is essentially the leakage and is equal to the operation equality, which is essentially when do the clients repeat their operations on the same label. So this is not revealing the label, but essentially when a query is repeated on the same label, right? So sort of the repetition pattern. Um, the key thing here is that in this setting, uh, we reveal the operation equality of all the pairs, irrespective of whether this pair was stored on good node or a bad node. However, in the single user setting, uh, this can be improved and uh, we can show that the adversary will only learn about the operation equality of a subset of labels. And this subset is essentially determined by the properties of uh, the underlying key, key value store. So in particular, uh, we isolated three properties of key value stores, which had security implications. We called the first property uh, the balance, second uh, non-committing allocations, whereas third uh, the consistency guarantee. And we show that if key value stores essentially satisfy these sort of two properties and a certain notion of consistency, then it's possible to show uh, that the leakage can be reduced in the single user setting. 
So at a high level, uh, balance sort of says that uh, with high probability, any adversary that is corrupted at most theta nodes should not see a label with more than epsilon probability. Okay, and we define this property of balance, this uh, this balance property using the using these four mappings that we had abstracted earlier for the key value store. So I'm not going to define this uh, second property because it's it's much more technical. So I'm going to skip it. So the third property that we required was that the key value store should satisfy a certain notion of consistency guarantee and uh, which is read your right consistency in our case. And read your right consistency essentially said that uh, clients should read their most recent write. So if they write a particular value, then they read it again, then they should read the most uh, latest value that they have written. That's what read your rights consistency guarantees. So we show that if uh, the key value store is indeed balanced and it's read your right consistent, then encrypted key value store is L epsilon secure with high probability. So L epsilon essentially means that uh, we are leaking only the operation equality of pairs that are visible to the adversary. That means that uh, operation equality of pairs that are either routed by uh, bad nodes or are stored by bad nodes. So the adversary does not learn the operation equality of pairs that are exclusively stored and routed by good nodes. Whereas in the multi-user setting, we were leaking uh, operation equality of all the pairs. So in our work, um, we also wanted to check if there are key value stores out there that even satisfy the balance property that we required from them right, to construct our secure encrypted key value stores. Because otherwise, what's the point? If uh, this balance property is too strong and no key value store can really satisfy it, then we cannot essentially construct secure uh, key encrypted key value stores. So we show that uh, CHKVSs, they indeed satisfy the property of balance. And here I'm showing uh, you the values of epsilon, theta, and delta for the case of zero hop routing, but we can show similar numbers for multi hop routing. It's, it's in our paper. So again, um, you do not have to look at these numbers, but uh, let me just give you some idea on whether uh, these are good or bad. So asymptotically, uh, this epsilon can be written as this, right? And it turns out that if we assign labels uniformly, uh, uniformly at random to row nodes where row was the replication uh, factor, so then the epsilon would be this, right? So this is the optimal epsilon that you could hope for because you're assigning uh, labels uniformly at random to nodes. So if you compare these two epsilon, then uh, there is only this extra logarithmic factor uh, uh, in this case, right? So this epsilon is not too far away from optimal. So therefore, uh, zero hop routing CHKVS uh, balances uh, data pretty well. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the end of uh, the technical section. So I'll quickly uh, talk about some of the future directions and some of the interesting problems that we can work on. So this work uh, was particularly exciting uh, because we have not seen these kinds of works before, which explored sort of uh, the fundamental connections between cryptography and the properties uh, in distributed systems. So for example, in distributed systems, we have seen works exploring connections between um, efficiency and consistency. While in cryptography, we have seen uh, sort of works exploring connections between leakage and efficiency. But this um, third relation is new and sort of unexplored. Uh, and it'll be interesting to study uh, this connection in more depth. So for example, uh, one thing is that uh, one question is that are stronger notions of consistency better for privacy, right? Because we saw that in the single user setting, once we assume read or write consistency, and of course, some other properties as well, uh, we could show that we can reduce the leakage. So the question is that, uh, uh, is this the case that by assuming stronger notions of consistency can we improve privacy as well? And if the answer is yes, so then can we use the same technique uh, same sort of assumption in multi-user setting to improve the leakage, 
right? And whereas if let's say the answer is no, can we show a lower bound on leakage in multi-user setting that you have to leak at least uh, this much in the multi-user setting irrespective of uh, what you assume about the consistency guarantees. And uh, that will be all. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Vasily Zikas, and I'm going to present the work on proof of reputation blockchain with Nakamoto Fallback, which is joint work with uh, Len Kleinrock and Rafi Ostrovsky. So here is an outline of uh, my talk. I will start with a very abstract discussion of what is a blockchain ledger and what is a blockchain ledger protocol. Uh, then we'll discuss how we can use reputation as a resource. Then uh, we focus on our construction of uh, proof of reputation blockchain and finally discuss how we address an inherent issue in reputation as a resource uh, in our work by a backup proof of stake blockchain or in general like a model blockchain. So let me start with uh, what is a blockchain based ledger. So as the name suggests, a, a blockchain ledger is a ledger, so it's a system that uh, stores a blockchain. This is a sequence of blocks that are connected uh, by hash pointers, and it offers to its users the following functionality at a very abstract level. Uh, so the users have transactions that they can submit and they want to insert in a block. Uh, those transactions are validated if they are found valid with respect to the current state of the ledger. They are added to a pending as next block. Uh, more transactions that come in are validated. If they're valid, they're added to the next pending block. Uh, some transactions might be considered invalid. And what happens is that periodically uh, the pending block is actually added to the blockchain. So this is uh, one function of uh, a blockchain ledger. The second function is that the users can query the ledger for its contents. They can ask the ledger for its state. And when they do, they get uh, as an answer the state. And another user can also ask. And the very important property of the ledger is that uh, when two different users ask the ledger, if the state of the ledger is the same, they learn the same thing. So they get consistent outputs. This is again a very idealized form of uh, what a blockchain ledger is, but uh, let's for now go uh, with that one as an abstraction. Okay, so uh, how does a protocol for uh, implementing such a ledger uh, look like? And again, at a very abstract level, I'm going to go in lower details in our protocol. We have a number of uh, parties that are the protocol parties. Usually those are called miners, as a legacy name from Bitcoin, where parties mine by trying to hash. And what those parties do is they know a state of the blockchain, hopefully a consistent one, and they receive from the users the transactions. They pull them in local transaction pools in sets of all valid transactions. And what happens is that uh, periodically one of or more even of the users is chosen to uh, be the one that proposes the next block. Uh, the chosen user puts all the transactions that he knows and are currently valid on a block, communicates the block to everyone along with evidence that he was actually chosen, and then everyone adds the block on the blockchain. This is at a very high level what happens. So to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, the two key questions that we ask when we're designing a blockchain ledger uh, uh, protocol are, who can propose the next block and uh, how can the miners agree on the blockchain ledger state? The first question is the one that uh, mainly differentiates the different technologies that are used for uh, uh, implementing blockchain ledgers. The two most widely known are proof of work in which uh, uh, the person that uh, proposes the next block is chosen according to the hash power he invests in the system. Uh, the second one is proof of stake. Uh, where uh, the person with the highest stake has highest chances of being chosen to be the next block proposer. And the one we consider here is proof of reputation in which the chances to be the one that proposes the next block are proportional to one's reputation. Now, the second question of how to agree on the blockchain ledger state is pretty much uniform in all these uh, settings. And it says that we are actually running an implicit consensus mechanism based on the assumption that's underlying the uh, uh, system, which is majority of uh, uh, honest work, majority of honest stake, or in our case, accuracy of the reputation estimate. And I will say what I mean by accuracy and quality, actually. 
This brings me to the second part of this talk, which is uh, how can we use reputation as a resource for supporting the security of a blockchain uh, ledger? The idea is that we will have what we call a reputation system. What is a reputation system? It assigns to each party, or let's say its reputation having party, a reputation that corresponds to the probability that this party behaves honestly in the protocol. This is the natural interpretation of more reputable parties have more chances of being honest. In the case of uh, our analysis, we're going to assume uncorrelated reputation, namely the events of becoming corrupted are pretty much independent between different parties, uh, which actually creates a very nice interpretation of the reputation. Uh, you can think of it as a rank of the sort that you have at Yelp or TripAdvisor or eBay. So it's a number corresponding to the probability of me being corrupted. It's independent of everyone else. Uh, we have in the full version of the paper a more general treatment as a general probability distribution, but uh, this is a much uh, harder case. Now, how can we use a reputation system? But the idea in the four is the following. If I choose a subset of the parties, then by knowing the reputation, remember that's the probability of being honest, I can actually estimate what's the probability of having an honest majority in the set I chose. Or I can actually do something more useful. I can use the reputation of the different parties to actually select a set that has very high probability of having honest majority. And as we're going to see uh, in a minute, honest majority is a property that we will want from any selection of uh, parties that we do. So how do we use reputation in our construction to devise a blockchain? The protocol idea is actually very simple and elegant. The timeline is divided in block rounds, where each such block round might be several protocol rounds. And in each such round, a block is proposed and agreed upon. So what happens is that at the beginning of each such round, Every party locally samples a very small polylog size uh, committee, which we will uh, call committee of endorsers. And inside this committee, it samples an even smaller, say constant size, three or five, uh, 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 subcommittee of block proposers. And then the parties perform the following three steps uh, to complete the block round. First, the proposers. Uh, broadcast to everyone all the transactions that they have uh, seen up to that round and are still valid. In a second step, the endorsers take the union of all transactions that they've heard being broadcasted since they're broadcasted. Again, it's, this is importantly, this is the broadcast is a Byzantine broadcast, so it's consistent for everyone. So they take the union, which is the same for everyone. Each of them signs it and sends uh, uh, the set and the signature to the other parties, only to the other endorsers. And finally, endorsers collect all the signals that they see on the set that they know. And if they see a set which has support of a majority, they diffuse it to everyone. So what's important to uh, notice here is that the first two steps only involve communication among CBA, which remember is a small subset of the entire player set. And only in the third step, we have a diffusion of the message sent through a network which uh, we don't really know. So this means that we don't need to flood. We don't need to uh, go and send to other parties, other neighbors, send to other neighbors and so on. We can directly communicate, which really limits, it, it, it reduces the communication overhead of the product. So to give you a, a graphical uh, uh, animation, if you want, of how the protocol proceeds, in every round, we select, as we said, a set of endorsers. And in this set, a subset of uh, uh, proposers. And let me focus on that one. What happens in its uh, uh, block round is the proposers take all the transactions that they know, and each of them broadcasts it using a Byzantine broadcast protocol. This means that uh, every party hears exactly the same thing. What do they do then? Each party signs the set that he heard and sends it to everyone else in this set. So once this happens, we zoom out, and every party that sees a majority of uh, uh, um, signatures uh, on, uh, on this set propagates it to the network. And now 
you know, it diffuses by a standard diffusion methodology as it happens with uh, um, uh, most uh, cryptocurrencies, but only in one step. And whoever sees such a set, which has a majority support from the actual block round endorsers uh, committee, accepts uh, uh, this set, accepts this as the next block. And then we can go in the next block round, select another uh, endorsers committee, another uh, uh, proposers committee, and so on and so forth. Now, what are the assumptions that we need for this protocol to work? Uh, on the network side, we actually assume synchrony. This is in, in the paper. We can actually uh, uh, remove synchrony and replace it with partial synchrony, which is pretty standard, but this analysis is not there. Um, and we also assume the common knowledge of the genesis block as usually, which includes the keys of the reputation parties and the reputation system that uh, describes the reputation of each party so that we do the lottery in the way I'm going to describe in the uh, next slides. So what do we need for the protocol I described to achieve its goal and be secure? We need to make sure that the committee of endorsers that we are selecting has a majority of honest parties. And uh, this majority will ensure that if anyone accepts a block, then this block can be unique. There cannot be two blocks supported by the majority, if the majority is honest. And secondly, we can actually, uh, uh, in the round where the uh, block proposers uh, propose their uh, send, broadcast their transactions, they can actually use an expected constant round uh, uh, broadcast protocol, which will reduce the uh, time of the overall protocol. So honest majority is a very important a property we want to achieve. So the question is, how can we sample the committee so that it has on its majority? All right. So what are we trying to do? We have a set of parties where each party has a reputation. This is the probability of the party being honest. And we're trying to select a small sublinear and then another one small constant size committee, uh, where in the sublinear committee of endorsers, we have honest majority. Now, can we do that? Not always. If, if the reputations of the parties are bad, right? So if the parties are not reputable, we cannot do it. Of course, if everyone has a high probability of being corrupted, there is no way we can select any committee of honest majority. That's a very uh, simple thing to uh, verify. However, for any reputation system which would allow such a selection, we know of an algorithm that allows us to actually sample an honest majority set. So if there is a way to sample an honest majority set of uh, polydoc size, then there is a, 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 an algorithm by Asaro, Flindel, and uh, Zarosim that tells us how to do it. And uh, the way to do it is very simple. What we do is we sort the parties in decreasing reputation, and then we select uh, sufficiently many from the most reputable to the least reputable. If the reputation system allows uh, for honest majority committees, of the size that we are looking, uh, then uh, this will give us uh, uh, an honest majority because it always selects the guys, the parties with the highest reputation. Now, as a side note, I will refer to reputation systems which do allow for honest majority committee selection of the size that we want as feasible reputation systems. What the theorem says is that feasible reputation systems always allow us to select on majority with this algorithm. So are we done? Unfortunately not, because this algorithm has an issue with fairness. So it is the case that always the parties with highest reputation are selected. So even if a party has very good reputation, but uh, it's not among the highest, he will never be selected in the protocol. And that creates an issue with participation, right? Parties with low reputation don't even want to be part of this protocol because they don't even care. So what we introduce is a property which we call reputation fairness, which has the following desideratum. First, we want that the higher the reputation of a party, the better the chances that this party is selected in the endorsers committee. Second, we want that parties with about the same reputation have about the same chance of being selected. And third, we want that the representation of parties from different reputation levels 
to the final set uh, is uh, proportional to their actual reputation. So you might be wondering why I'm introducing three. Might look that uh, three is implied by one, but this is not the case. Think of the following example. Assume that I have a reputation system with M1 um, parties that have reputation three quarters, and then M2, four times M1 parties that have much lower reputation, one quarter. And now I go and select each party to be part of the committee that I want with probability exactly proportional to uh, 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 its reputation. This means that uh, I'm expecting roughly three quarter M1 parties to be from the uh, set that has uh, reputation three quarter. But then I'm expecting roughly another M1 to be from the set that uh, have reputation uh, uh, one quarter. And that's really bad, right? Because I'm selecting way too many parties with reputation one quarter. So if you do the math, you're going to see that uh, in the final set, although I have a lot of parties with a very high reputation three quarter, I'm not even succeeded, succeeding in getting a honest majority committee. What do we do instead? We introduced a tiered approach to reputation fairness. So we uh, um, divide the parties into tiers according to the reputation. Here in this uh, uh, demonstration, I have four tiers, uh, parties with reputation higher than uh, uh, three quarters, parts from reputation half up to three quarters, parts with reputation uh, um, one quarter up to half, and parts with reputation less than a quarter. And note that with what I'm going to do now, we're going to actually have inclusivity by our fairness notion, even to the low reputation parties, but with the lower representation factors. So now, the way that the uh, reputation fairness desideratum is translated to this tiered reputation setting is that uh, uh, a party from the reputation tier uh, TI, the ith reputation tier, is twice uh, as likely uh, being chosen in the committee as a party from uh, the immediately lower reputation. By the way, depending on the number of tiers, we can play with this parameter to be something definitely bigger than one, but have like a, a, a different level of uh, representation. We can do we a different level of probability uh, uh, depending on what we want here. Uh, second, parties from the same tier have exactly the same probability of being chosen in the set. And third, um, the number of parties from the higher tier TI is twice the number of parties from the lower tier. And once again, we can play with uh, this twice and make it C times. And if you look at what this gives us, at least with the twice as high, uh, if we have more than, say, uh, uh, four uh, reputation tiers, this will always guarantee honest majority in the committee. This, this, this property will always guarantee honest majority in the committee. Um, of course, with overwhelming probability, with very high probability, uh, just by having sufficiently many uh, parties in each of the high reputation tiers. So if there aren't sufficiently many, uh, there is a way to counter. I'm not going to discuss it here. So how do we sample to achieve the guarantees from the previous slide? Where our algorithm does the following. It selects a number L1 from the highest uh, reputation tier, then another number L2 from the highest together with the second highest, their union. And if I select the same guy from uh, T1 twice, then I just replace him and get another one. Then another uh, number L3 from the union of the first three reputations and so on and so forth. And uh, L1, L2, and L3 are computed so that they satisfy certain conditions. Uh, um, I'm not going to go into details, but by doing some uh, uh, not too complicated uh, uh, algebra, uh, you can uh, see that uh, those uh, you know, beautiful equations give you exactly what you need, that the number of, uh, of uh, all parties you're choosing is polylog, log to the one plus epsilon, and all the properties that uh, uh, we wanted from the reputation fairness definition. It's easy to see that the previous algorithm will give us the guarantees that we need, but I want to highlight that because of using reputation, we also get some very nice properties that reputation has. First of all, we get finality, which is common in iterated VFT block chain. So the next block is decided and agreed upon on, upon the end of the uh, block round. More importantly, 
the reputation can be thought of as information that is given to us about the adversary. And this, for example, means that we don't need to worry about the adaptive corruptions. Right? A party with high reputation will not get corrupted with the probability that his reputation indicates. So this means that uh, we don't need to have the lottery itself right. We just need to worry about the randomness, which is what we do here. And perhaps even more importantly, we can actually have parties communicate with each other over direct channels. They can know each other because there are parties with reputation and they are bad. Their network is also bad and attackable with this reputation. So this means less flooding, as we saw, which means less communication over. However, it does come at a cost. And uh, one would argue that uh, reputation is a subjective resource and manipulatable. So how do we deduce reputation? We observe a party's behavior, we get information about what he does online and so on, or what he does in our protocol. Now, a party might behave honestly until he gets high reputation and then uh, attack the system. This means that our reputation system might not reflect exactly the probability of honesty. So how can we address that? We address it by devising a hybrid design that uses proof of reputation as a primary blockchain. So it harvests all the nice properties from reputation, but to make sure that our reputation estimate doesn't create security issues, it also operates in parallel a secondary Nakamoto-style blockchain that's based on a different assumption, for example, proof of stake. Importantly, on the secondary blockchain, we only post digests from the uh, primary blockchain, no transactions or nothing. So this is a very lightweight use of the secondary blockchain. And what we prove for this combination, I'm not going to go into details, but I will just tell you what the uh, result is here, is that if the reputation system is accurate, then we don't even need to worry about the secondary blockchain. We enjoy all the nice properties. If we have a bad estimation of the reputations, and it happens that uh, we assume that a party might stay honest with higher probability than it actually might, then if the fallback security guarantee is true, right? If the uh, uh, party, if the majority of stake is actually in honest hands, if you want proof of stake, then still our system remains secure. It might not be as efficient, but it remains secure, and we can use a secondary blockchain to bootstrap and go back to the a primary blockchain and enjoy all the nice properties. So in some sense, we can have the pie and eat it too. To conclude in this work, uh, we discussed how reputation can be used as a resource for efficient blockchains. Um, we devised the def a definition of reputation fairness, which boosts inclusivity in a blockchain protocol, and therefore incentivizes potential participation. And uh, we showed how to address the subjective nature of reputation uh, by a Nakamoto fallback blockchain, which gives us a security even if we have a bad estimation of reputation. There is a number of open problems here. Uh, the first one is how can we actually estimate reputations properly? This is uh, related to an AI. How can we use information we have about uh, the different reputation parties to assign to them reputation accurately, which is also important for the bootstrapping of any system relying on reputation. Um, the second one is how can we have incentives that uh, make parties want to increase the reputation? Right? So reputation is something abstract, but it can be connected with real properties, but uh, we want like an analysis which shows that parties do want to increase reputation and how we can use reputation potential to penalize parties that misbehave. And the third one is that our analysis currently is uh, uh, asymptotic um, for a more a practical system here, it would be good to have a concrete analysis with concrete parameters and error probabilities. This is also something we uh, are planning to work on and uh, happy to hear input. So with that, I would like to... Hello everyone, and thanks for listening to this presentation of our article, Transciphering using Philip and Tevici for an efficient delegation of computation. I've worked on this research during an internship at Thales with Thomas Ricosset from Thales and Pierrick Meo from the UCL, Université Catholique de Louvain. First, a bit of context. Say you have some data and you want to compute a function of them. But you want to delegate this computation because it is heavy and you want a server to do it. However, you don't trust the server. You know he's honest but curious, which means he won't perform any unwanted operations on the data you send him 
but you will look into them. Uh, the cryptographic solution uh, for this scenario is an anamorphic encryption scheme. The idea is that you can encrypt your data with such a scheme, send them encrypted to the server, the server will perform operations on the encrypted data, will send you back the results, and when decrypting it, you will have the function, the, fun the evaluation of the function you wanted. There are different degrees for homomorphic encryption scheme. The schemes can be somewhat homomorphic, or level homomorphic, or fully homomorphic. Fully homomorphic is the best one, in the sense that it allows to perform any operation uh, on your encrypted data, and it has been achieved in 2009 by Craig Gentry. Since then, there has been many fully homomorphic schemes, and they can be gathered in three generations. The main issue with homomorphic encryption schemes is that they are heavy, uh, in the sense that the ciphertext weights more encryption and decryption takes more time than with regular encryption schemes. The main idea of transciphering is to reduce the amount of computation and the usage of bandwidth client side. So let's say the client is a small device who cannot perform homomorphic encryption. It will just have to uh, perform a light symmetric encryption scheme, send the symmetric cipher to the servers. The server will then be able, using an homomorphic encryption of the symmetric key, to perform transciphering which means to transform the symmetric cipher into an homomorphic one. To do so, you will have to homomorphically evaluate the symmetric decryption function. Our main contribution is the implementation in C language uh, of a transciphering. This is the first time a transciphering was implemented using third generation homomorphic encryption schemes, and we try to use the characteristics of the third generation uh, to perform more efficient transciphering. In the transciphering protocol, there are two schemes. So first, uh, we will introduce the TFHE scheme and uh, the leveled homomorphic scheme uh, we implemented. Then in the second time, uh, we'll talk about the stream cipher uh, symmetric scheme Philip and how to efficiently homomorphically evaluate it Finally, uh, I will present our results and compare them uh, with other transcipherings, like for example, second generation homomorphic ones. TFHE stands for Torus Fully Homomorphic Encryption because uh, all the computations are performed over the real torus, which is basically the reals modulo one. Uh, we can also define a polynomial structure over this torus with a standard uh, negacyclic uh, polynomial ring. Uh, we also have a notation for binaries and for binary polynomials that we'll use through this presentation. TFHE schemes rely on the learning with errors over the terrorist problem. Learning with errors is a very common problem that is used in many lattice-based schemes. The idea behind it is pretty simple. If you have a secret vector S uh, and are given uh, public vectors A and the scalar product with S, if you have enough uh, public vectors A, you can retrieve S. Uh, it's equivalent to solving a linear system. Uh, so you just perform Gaussian elimination and blah, blah, blah. Uh, however, if you just add a little bit of noise in each of your scalar products, uh, retrieving S becomes an art problem. And this is the learning with errors problem. It exists in different versions. So the one I just presented is uh, the set version when we try to retrieve S. So there is also the decision version, where you, just, where you just have to distinguish between a uniform distribution or a distribution coming from a learning with error sampler. Uh, there is also a ring version, where your scalar product is uh, replaced by a convolution product between polynomials. All those problems are equivalent. We can define an encryption scheme that relies directly on the LWE problem. So one described here is used uh, by TFHE for the fully homomorphic scheme. Uh, you take a message from a message space, uh, which is a sub discrete subset of the interval C1. The key is just a binary vector. And 
with this message, you just create an LWE sample. Uh, you add your message with the error. Uh, to retrieve the message, you just take the last term of your ciphertext. You uh, subtract the, uh, the inner product to this last term. You end up with the message plus the error, and you get rid of the error by rounding up to the closest element of your message space. Uh, what is important to note is that there is noise in the messages, in the ciphertext, sorry. Uh, which means that if the noise gets too important, you lose the message information. TFHE also defines TLWE samples that are basically LWE samples with polynomials. So we can note that there are two dimension parameters, the dimension of the vector and the degree of the polynomials. If the dimension of the vector is one, then uh, TLWE relies directly on LWE. If the degree of the polynomial is one, then they collapse to the constant coefficient and the underlying problem becomes a binary LWE. LWE based schemes are naturally additive, which means that if you sum two ciphertext, uh, you get a ciphertext of the sum of the messages. However, there is a noise growth during the operation and we need to remain careful that we keep the correctness of the scheme. Now we have an homomorphic addition, but we still cannot perform product and we need both addition and multiplication to perform any operation we like and to evaluate Philip. Uh, that's why we need to introduce a bigger object, which is TGSW sample. So a TGSW sample uh, is a matrix and to get it you just take a matrix where each line is a TLWE sample of zero and you add your message encoded with what's called a gadget matrix. Using TGSW samples we can perform external product so it's called external because it's an operation between TGSW sample and TLWE samples. So details of this operation uh, include a decomposition using the gadget matrix which gives the basis uh, but what is important is that at the end we get a TLWE sample encoding the product of the messages so it gives us an amorphic multiplication. Using uh, the TFHE tools I have described we were able to implement a leveled homomorphic scheme. This scheme encrypts uh, binary messages as TGSW ciphertext. So we chose to have TGSW ciphers uh, because uh, it was important that at the end, after the transciphering, the server could still perform any operation on the homomorphic ciphers it got. Uh, if we chose to remain in TLWE, we've seen that we don't have a product between TLWE ciphers. Uh, so binary messages choice uh, comes from the fact that uh, when you perform multiplication, uh, the plain text norm appears in the uh, in the error formula, and we want the error to remain small so that we can make multiple multiplications, and that's why we we have small messages. The scheme in itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, uh, to encode a message, we just create a TGSW sample of this message. And in order to retrieve the message, uh, we use uh, a well-chosen line of our ciphertext, which gives us a TLWE cipher. And we, when we decrypt this TLWE cipher, we can retrieve the message. With our scheme, we have a native homomorphic addition, which is some ciphertext in order to get the ciphertext of the sum of the messages. Examining uh, the noise growth during operation, since the noise generated is random, there are several ways of examining the noise growth during homomorphic operation. We can look into the worst case scenario or, or an average case scenario. One of the contributions of TFHE uh, is that it allows to look average case scenario, which gives more tight bounds, and that's what we did for our study. So the evolution of the noise during homomorphic addition is linear. We also have an homomorphic product by defining an internal product, which is easy to define using the external product introduced earlier. The error growth during the multiplication is a bit trickier, uh, so we won't give the formula, but what is important to note is that it is asymmetric, which means the noise of A 
dot b is not the same as the one of p dot a so it is important when we implement it to put our event uh, in the right way and also uh, the noise depends on the plain text value so multiplication by a cipher of 0 won't give the same noise as a multiplication by a cipher of 1 Post those properties in such generation allows to perform a lot of multiplication Now that we have our monomorphic encryption scheme, we need our stream cipher. So this figure uh, explains how Philip works. Basically, there is a totally public P -RNG, the CD is public, everything is public, and a key register. With the P -RNG, you'll start by taking a subset of the key. Then you'll shuffle this subset, and finally you'll XOR uh, random bits from the PRNG to this shuffle. All this operation can be easily performed homomorphically. Actually, if the key register is ciphers instead of just uh, regular bits, you can perform all this operation without adding any noise. Just taking a subset and shuffling and adding known values uh, isn't really a homomorphic operation. It does not take time, it does not add noise. But after you've done all that, you have to pass the filter from which comes the security of the scheme so a filter is a boolean function and it outputs one bit which will be our stream cipher bit in this work we consider two families of filter and i will present both of them right now so the first one is tsm filters tsm stands for direct sum of monomials so it's basically a boolean function where each variable appears once and only once and it's a sum of product it can be represented by a direct sum vector uh, so there is an example in the slide and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, since it's just sum and product, it's easy to homomorphically evaluate. You just compute your sum and your product as you will do with plain text. So DSM filters we used for implementation have around 1,200 variables and they can be evaluated with, with as many homomorphic operations. The second family of filters we used are XORMASH filters. So XOR MASH boolean function is just the sum of a XOR function and a MASH function. XOR function just outputs the sum of its variables, so XOR of its variables. And the MASH is a majority function. So it outputs 1 if at least half of its entry is 1 and 0 if not. Uh, the one we use uh, is uh, a function with 144 variables. Uh, it can seem less than DSM function, but so mash functions are a bit trickier to evaluate homomorphically. We don't have time to get into the details, but uh, it can be used using a decision circuit with MUX and in homomorphic evaluation, when you do evaluation condition circuit, you always have to look into every condition because you can't really know the value of the data you are manipulating, so you can do real condition something. So uh, at the end, it takes about as much computation to homomorphically evaluate a 144 variables XOR MASH function than a 1000 and so TSM function. Since we know the functions we want to homomorphically evaluate, we needed to choose the parameters for homomorphic scheme. These uh, parameters must fulfill two requirements. First, they must grant enough security, so 128 bit security. To evaluate the security given by our parameters, we use an LWE hardness estimator. Secondly, these parameters must guarantee that we can correctly evaluate our filter, uh, which means that the noise will not overflow during the homomorphic operations. We require that at any time, uh, the probability of decryption failure for a ciphertext remains under 2 power minus 128, if uh, this requirement is not fulfilled, it can lead to attacks. With all that in mind, uh, we made a noise evolution model and ended up with two sets of parameters. The performances of our implementations are given in the following table. So for the different set of parameters and for the different filters I've introduced. So data we use to evaluate our performances as the latency and the key size. First, the key size is just the memory size of the symmetric key server side, and the latency is the time needed to output the first bit. So, in the case of Philips, since it's a stream cipher, 
latency is the same than throughput. It means basically that we can transfer one bit every approximately two seconds. We also implemented uh, another scheme, which is a mix between TGSW and TLWE scheme. The idea is the encrypted symmetric key is still TGSW ciphers, but at the beginning of the filter evaluation, we transform the first TGSW cipher into a TLW1 of the same message, and then we can perform external product all the way of the evaluation of a cipher. So it leads to a faster filter evaluation, since the external product is faster than the internal one, and smaller cipher text, because the cipher text becomes TLWE ones. Uh, but that's also the problem, because with a TLWE cipher, we cannot perform homomorphic multiplication, so the resulting homomorphic cipher is not totally usable by the server. It needs to perform a bootstrapping and transform it into another cipher to use another scheme. So we can see the performance gain uh, in the following table. Uh, it is a table that compares different versions of Philip. Uh, in this one you can find the basic TGSWE scheme, the mixed TGSWE TLWE scheme, which is around two times faster, but also a TFHE scheme. So for this one, we just implemented transciphering using uh, the TFHE library as it was intended to be used with fully homomorphic operation, but it's way slower. And also a previous version of Philip with second generation homomorphic library. We also compared our implementation performances with existing transcipherings. Uh, we ended up with a good latency. However, our throughput was uh, slower than most of other transcipherings. This is, you, uh, this is because they use patching, uh, which means that in a single cipher test, they can pack several messages. The downside of this technique is that uh, your cipher text become linked you cannot perform operation between two plain texts that are say, encrypted uh, in the same ciphertext. To conclude, in this work, we implemented for the first time a transciphering using third generation homomorphic encryption. We also implemented new filters uh, for Philip because in the previous implementation only DSM filters were implemented. We ended up with good latency uh, we could still improve the throughput by batching our messages. Uh, our homomorphic scheme could accept binary polynomial as messages. If we manage to do so, uh, we would gain a factor 1000 for the throughput with the downsides I've talked about just earlier. Another improvement will be to be able to bootstrap the resulting cipher uh, because because it will allow to perform an unlimited number of operations on the data server side. Thanks for your attention. Welcome to this presentation on delayed authentication, preventing replay and relay attacks in private contact tracing. My name is Krzysztof Jeczak and I'm at IST Austria. So this talk is about contact tracing, which is a term from public health, <clears throat> where the general idea is to curb the spread of a contagious disease by identifying the contacts of, uh, of infected people and make sure that they don't spread the uh, disease any further. Now, traditionally, this has been done by simply interviewing diagnosed people and ask them who they met and then, then try to con contact and warn those contacts. More recently, something called digital contact tracing came up and Basically, the idea is to leverage the fact that nowadays <clears throat> most people run around with the mobile phone all days and kind of somehow use that for contract tracing. And the by far most popular instantiation of this approach is to basically have some app that is installed on the phone of participants. Then this app would constantly record and announce itself uh, to other apps so that later if a person is identified, all person with which uh, this person came in contact and that also have this app can be alerted. There are many different aspects of such contact tracing apps that have been extensively discussed in the scientific and uh, literature and uh, popular news. Um, for example, one is efficiency and simplicity. For ex you really don't want the app to kind of drain your battery or you don't want to kind of your videos to stall just because the app is running in the background. Another very important fact is uh, very important aspect is privacy. 
ultimately we want users to use this app voluntarily. So it's very important that they don't feel that they're giving away more privacy than is really necessary for this task. And there are other discussions going on, for example, uh, utility. Should the app really just, con uh, just record contacts or also kind of more information that could, for example, allow to, to find hotspots uh, or things like that. Um, and in this talk, I want to uh, address an aspect that I think has been not sufficiently addressed so far in the literature, namely the security of such contact tracing apps. And when we talk about security, it's kind of not a priori clear what it even means for a contact tracing app to be secure or robust. Um, but I think the two basic failures that one can uh, identify for such an app are false positives and false negatives. Now, false positive simply means that a person is alerted even though that person was not in proximity or in contact with, an, uh, with the person that has late been diagnosed. Of course, it cannot mean that the person gets alerted even though that person is not uh, actually infected or sick. This is not something that the, that the app can do. Uh, and in the same way, uh, a false negative simply means that the person doesn't get alerted, even though they were in proximity with the sick person. So false negatives kind of many reasons. There could be a malicious denial of service attack that prevents the app from recording these uh, connections. There could be all kinds of communication failures, bugs in the implementation, wrong parameter settings. Maybe your battery is empty. Um, but false positives seem to be kind of the more uh, urgent and more important uh, aspect to address. Now. On a small scale, false positives seem very generic and easy to launch on any contact tracing apps. For example, I could, I could always borrow the phone from somebody, run with this app around in the city, and then bring this phone back. And when that person gets, uh, uh, gets diagnosed, then everyone I met will actually get an alert. And what is more important is to prevent such false positives on a very large scale. And in the literature, basically two attacks have been identified which can be used to created false positives on a very large scale against the current apps that are used. One is replay and relay attacks, and this is actually the topic of this presentation. And the other one are inverse Sybil attacks, which I will mention very shortly at the end of this talk. Now, now the by far most popular uh, digital contact tracing app out there is the Google Apple Exposure Notification API. So it's, uh, it's basically a system that is running on every iOS or Android phone and on top of which one can implement such, uh, such contact tracing apps. The protocol itself is based on previous uh, academic protocols, particularly DP3T from Europe and COVID watch from the US. The protocol itself is almost uh, extremely simple. It just works as follows. So if the app is installed, it will basically generate a temporary exposure key K, this key K here, once a day. From this key, roughly every 15 minutes, a fresh identifier is created. And this identifier is then constantly broadcast during those five, 15 minutes. At the same time, every app constantly records all identifiers it receives. So for example, in this case, Miss Piggy here would uh, record this identifier here that she received from Kermit. Um, and I will actually explicitly put these values that parties have to constantly store on their phone into such uh, pink boxes like here, because this will be useful for later. Okay, now if Kermit gets uh, diagnosed, so he gets, he goes to the doctor, then he gets kind of a permission to upload his uh, exposure keys to a backend server. And regular, regular users will say once a day, download all the uploaded keys. They will derive all the identifiers from those keys and then check if any of the der derived identifiers matches what they have locally stored on their phone. And if there is a match, they will panic. Now, of course, in practice, this is more difficult. If there is an alert, will depend on things like the signal strength and the duration of the exposure and so on. But uh, for this talk, this is, uh, this is an orthogonal problem that, we will not, that is not relevant for this presentation. Okay, so what are uh, replay and relay attacks? Now assume actually Kermit meets Cookie Monster here, who is like a malicious guy. He receives this identifier from Kermit and maybe at a later time point and at a totally different location, he simply replays the identifiers he has uh, received and stored from other parties. So Gonzo would get this identifier here. Why is this a problem? Uh, if Kermit gets diagnosed and uploads his key, Gonzo will think he has been in contact with an infected person, even though that's not the case. A very similar attack are relay attacks. It's basically a replay attack in real time. So here we have like not just one attacker, but we can think of them as two attackers. And Cookie Monster here will in real time relay the messages to uh, load count. 
and uh, you know, again, Gonzo will think he was infected. So for this protocol, really and replay attacks are basically the, you know, it doesn't really matter, but we will see later that for, you know, once we start hardening the protocols, there will be actually a difference between this real-time relay attack or a replay attack that actually just replays things um, later in time. Uh, one of the early works that actually tried to harden these existing uh, protocols against replay attacks is Wodernay's uh, papers. It's an, <coughs> it's an e print, uh, as shown in the link above. So his idea is very simple and in inspired by symmetric identif identification protocols. So the protocol basically starts off as the protocol I just showed you, where you maybe with one minor difference. Uh, from the daily key, we not only derive an identifier, but also like a key little k, which is a key for a symmetric authentication scheme. Otherwise, everything is the same. But now, if Miss Piggy receives an identifier, the protocol continues. She, she samples a random challenge string, say, you know, a 100-bit random challenge string. She sends that string, that challenge, back to, to the sender of the ID. And then Kermit here will have to compute the message authentication code or authenticate the ID and the challenge using this key K he derived from his daily key. And this authentication tag he will send back to Miss Piggy, who will kind of store this identifier challenge tag triple. Now, if Kermit gets diagnosed, uh, you know, everything else as before, he uploads the key, uh, Miss Piggy gets the key, she derives the identifier, and if it matches, she doesn't panic quite yet, she does one more check. She also takes the key k, little k that she derived from the, uh, from the daily key, and she actually checks if the tag matches. So if the tag is indeed an authentication of the ID and the challenge under this k, little k, and only if this is also the case, she will kind of start panicking. Um, how does this protocol prevent replay attacks? Uh, anticipate an adversary, Cookie Monster again here, who interacted with Kermit. So he has stored this, you know, he received this triple ID challenge tag here. And at a later time point, he might want to replay this ID. So he replays this ID to, to, to Gonzo here. But Gonzo will pick a totally fresh challenge, challenge star. And this challenge will almost certainly be different from the challenge that the Cookie Monster chose before. So in order to kind of really make Gonzo uh, trigger an alert, should Kermit later be diagnosed, he would have to forge a message authentication tag. But you know, if this is IS or something, we believe this is uh, computationally infeasible. So this protocol that I showed you, okay, it solves replay attacks, but it has one big disadvantage, namely this interaction. So these uh, Google Apple API protocols for communication, they in particular use something that is called low energy Bluetooth. This is a uh, interface that does, does not even allow for sessions. And for various other reasons, we really do not want to have this interaction. And we would like to stick with this extremely simple template where uh, advertising apps simply broadcast some value that is then stored by other apps. Uh, here's a very simple idea how to make this protocol from before non-interactive. So note that the only message that actually goes in the wrong direction, namely from Miss Piggy to Kermit, is this challenge. Now, what we could do is we, for example, could replace this challenge simply with the current time. This is something that both parties know and just can locally, uh, locally derive. Let's say the current time rounded to the, you know, to the second. And now the protocol is as before, but they simply use the time t uh, instead of the challenge. So Kermit would kind of compute the tag and he would authenticate the current time and send this tag over to Miss Piggy, who would then store the identifier, the time, and the tag. And you know, later she would verify that indeed the tag is a Mac of T, should Kermit get diagnosed. And it's not hard to see that this actually also prevents uh, replay attacks because if one would want, let's say Miss Piggy would want to replay that identifier at the later time point, she would basically have to forge a tag for a time t plus delta, where delta is the time since uh, she met Kermit. And again, this would basically uh, boil down to, uh, to forging uh, the message authentication code. Um, there is one big problem with this approach, namely if we look what parties store now, we see that Miss Piggy actually has to store the, not only information that reveals that she met Kermit, if we have, which is unavoidable, but she also has to re, uh, store information, or she stores information when that encounter happened. And from a pi privacy perspective, this is uh, really problematic. People might, not want, you know, people might not want to do that. It's actually what the Google Apple API does to some extent. So this is a layout of the scheme. So this up here is the daily key. Uh, using some hash key derivation function, we derive some key, which is then used to authenticate the time. It's some int, uh, e an interval number, which is basically a value that rotates every 15 minutes. And from this, we then derive this identifier. And then there is also some metadata. This is the stuff on the right. 
Um, now, this means that basically they use this idea with the time on the granularity of 15 minutes. This has the disadvantage that, of course, replay attacks are still possible in a 15 minutes window. And from a privacy perspective, it's still a problem. I mean, you, you, you can, if you confiscate the, the phones of users, you can figure out when they met up to a granularity of 15 minutes. Um, so far, I only talked about uh, you know, replay attacks. What about relay attacks? So this scheme is, of course, not secure against relay attacks. If the messages, you know, if, if Ms. Piggy is malicious and she relays the message to somebody at a totally different location in real time, that person will have the same time and will be ultimately convinced that he talked with Kermit, should Kermit get uh, diagnosed. But it's actually easy to extend this protocol to also take into account other coordinates rather than time. For example, they could additionally authenticate their location, not just their time. Location could, for example, mean the cell towers IDs they see, or maybe some coarse grain GPS coordinates, coarse grain like a 50 times 50 meter grid, just to make sure that people who are physically close actually will be in the same grid point. Um, but of course, this would require the app to also use uh, GPS or uh, other interfaces. Now, a natural question is, so can we have both? Can we have a privacy preserving protocol that does not reveal our time or even location um, while still being non-interactive? And indeed, there is a very simple solution that uses somewhat heavier crypto, heavier than the symmetric key crypto that is used in the original scheme, namely digital signatures. Here's the protocol, it's very simple. Now, the advertising app, so Kermit here, would simply derive a, a, public, signet, a public secret key pair for a digital signature scheme, and then he would sign the current time using the secret key. What he would send, you know, what he would broadcast is the public key together with the signature, and Miss Piggy would basically just store the public key. After doing one check, so she would actually check that the signature sigma here really is a signature of the current time that she locally received under that public key. And should Kermit get later uh, diagnosed, Miss Piggy will get his key, she will derive uh, this public key, and if there is a match, then she will uh, be alert. And again, public keys are usually big enough so that they can, uh, always big enough so that they can actually so, uh, serve as uh, unique identifiers here. Um, and the nice property of this protocol is, of course, now if we look at what values are stored, they are kind of totally independent of the time when uh, Miss Piggy and Kermit met, right? It's, we see that they met because this public key was derived from the key that uh, Kermit stores, which is necessary, but nothing beyond that. But it uses public key crypto, which is arguably quite a bit heavier than the hashing or maybe IS used in the current protocol. So the question we looked at is if we can have a protocol like that, uh, privacy preserving and non-interactive, just using simple uh, symmetric key cryptographic scheme, let's say just, just hashing, for example. And indeed, so I will show you such a protocol now. It's <clears throat> We termed it delayed authentications for reasons that we come to you later. So we start again with the protocol from before. So this is the non-interactive protocol that reveals the time. So Ms. Piggy has to store the time here. And the basic idea is to now use a statistically hiding commitment scheme. So let me remind you, statistically hiding commitment scheme is a function. It takes us input the message, some randomness uh, R, and it outputs a commitment, and it has two security properties. The first is hiding. So for any two messages, M and prime, if we compute the commitment with some fresh randomness, the distribution of that commitment will be statistically close in both cases. So the commitment information theoretically hides the message that is committed. The other property is computationally, the computational binding property, which basically asks you that it should be computationally hard or infeasible to find any tuples uh, and, and any message randomness tuples where the messages are different, that uh, would result in the same commitment. What Kermit now does is, he basically, instead of, uh, of, of authenticating, uh, computing a message authentication code of the time, he first computes a signature, uh, he first computes a commitment of the time, so he samples some randomness row and computes this commitment sigma of the current time, and then he authenticates this commitment. What he sends over to uh, Miss Piggy is as before the ID and the stack, and additionally the randomness he used to compute the commitment. Miss Piggy will recompute the commitment, and what she would store is the identify the tag and the, uh, and the commitment. Um, why should this be secure? So it's not hard to see that a successful replay attack would actually require an attacker to either break the message authentication code as before, or in this case, it's additionally sufficient to break the binding property of the commitment scheme. Um, but now, unlike before, this protocol is 
much more private in the sense that the values jointly stored by Kermit and Miss Piggy do not reveal the time when they actually met because you know, Miss Piggy just stores a, a computationally high, statistically hiding commitment of the time and not the time itself. And even though this protocol is very simple, it might be a little bit unintuitive for cryptographers in the sense that we usually use commitments to commit to a message that we have now and later we reveal the randomness to show what, what was contained in that uh, commitment. Here is kind of the opposite. Here we actually have a message where everyone knows, the, you know, both parties know the message. Uh, and so we send over this commitment. And the idea is that later we can actually forget about, uh, about the message and still be sure that we authenticated the same thing, um, the correct thing, even though the key required to verify the, you know, to, the MAC key is only revealed at a later time. So in the paper, uh, uh, actually a new primitive is defined. So what I showed you before is a bit, looks a bit like a hack, but in fact, you can simply see this protocol before as the original protocol, but where we use something this, that we term a delayed message authentication code. And it's, in a nutshell, it's basically normal message authentication code. But now the verification of the uh, authentication attack has two steps, uh, not just one as usually, but the two steps have different functionality. So the first step, this verification one, only takes us input um, the message and the tag, but not any secret key. And it outputs something that is statistically independent of the message. And then there is a second step that only takes a secret key and this input that is now independent of the message and uh, verifies. In particular, the construction I showed before would, would result in such a delayed message authentication code uh, you know, using, standard, using a standard message authentication code in combination with the statistically hiding commitment as shown uh, on the bottom. Okay. So now in the Google Apple API, um, this Google Apple API uses something that is called low energy Bluetooth. As I mentioned before, this is a, basically a scaled down version of Bluetooth that has no sessions. And basically what it can do is just broadcast beacons. And the beacons that are broadcast are 31 bytes. And the Google Apple API basically uses 16 of those 31 bytes for this identifier. And the rest is reserved for other stuff, in particular some metadata and headers and so on. So the question is, can we just use this uh, protocol that I just showed you now, this delayed authentication protocol, as a fall-in replacement um, to strengthen the security of this Google Apple API against replay attacks without really changing the protocol much, which would basically require to kind of fit the message that we need to broadcast, which is not just an identifier, but an identifier, a tag, and this message um, row, into 128 bits. And uh, a priority seems kind of totally impossible to do if you want any kind of meaningful security guarantees. Um, in particular, how would we compute the commitment in practice? We would simply use a hash function and to commit the message M with the randomness row, we would simply concatenate the message in the randomness, uh, apply a hash function and truncate it at L bits. Now it's well known that if we want statistical hiding, um, the randomness should be at least as long as the output. So this uh, row should be at least L. Moreover, to get computationally binding requires the hash function H to be collision resistant. And finally, we know that to achieve, because of birthday attacks, we know to achieve collision resistance with n bit security, so security against adversaries who run in time up to two to the n, requires an output length that is in the ballpark of at least two times n. So in particular, with 128 bits, so if L is 128 bits, we cannot even hope to get any security better than 64. And even for the 64 security, we would use up the entire tag just for the randomness. And you know, there is still a tag that we have to, to fit in and then identify it. This one, one simple observation is actually that for this particular protocol, for a, successful, um, for a successful replay attack, it's not sufficient to just find collisions. Because what happens is the honest sender, Kermit in this case, he chooses the randomness row. And then given this randomness row in the identifier and the current time, the adversary has to find now another, uh, you know, for another time t prime, he has to find another uh, randomness row prime that will commit to the same value. And this translates to a new requirement to the hash function. We don't need the hash function to be collision resistant. It's in fact sufficient if it's only second pre-image resistant. And it's known that for second pre-image resistance, it's in fact sufficient that, um, it's sufficient to have a, to get n bits of security. It's sufficient to have an output length of you know slightly more than n. So in particular, in our protocol, we set the randomness to be 80 bits, and we will get um, basically 80 bits of security um, for the commitment scheme. Now there is also this tag and this ID. We set the tag to 35 bits and the identifier to 10 bits, 
And we claim that this actually gives very good practical uh, cryptographic security for the scheme. And I will not go into the details, but uh, you, know, you can look them up in the paper. So we claim it's indeed possible to squeeze those tags uh, into 128 bits and gets very, get very meaningful security guarantees. OK, so I promised you at the beginning that uh, I will also mention a few words about the other attack that allows for large scales false positives. And this attack is termed inverse Sybil attack. And it roughly works as follows. So assume you have like a group, yeah, here I just showed three, but think a thousand of malicious parties. Either these are malicious parties, this could also be honest users whose phone simply got hacked. And what they do is they all instantiate their phones with the same initial keys. What happens then is, you know, those thousand people roam through the city and all of them use the same identifiers because they have the same initial keys to broadcast. So we have a thousand people broadcasting the same identifiers. And if later one of them gets, um, uh, gets diagnosed and is allowed to upload his key, not only his contacts would be alerted, but anyone who was uh, in, in proximity to any one of those three people shown here will also get an alert. So I think it's a very simple attack to, um, to launch a very large scale false, uh, false positives. And it's substantially harder to prevent this attack, it seems, than replay attacks. And if you want to know more about it and maybe some initial ideas how to do it, uh, he, uh, below here is a link to a recent ePrint paper. Okay, thank you for attending the talk. <laughs>